Before we move to actually training models, um, I wanted to talk through some of the common problems that you may face when you go to fit models and also when you go to apply them so that you kind of know what you're getting into uh, before you actually move to doing this in code. So some of the common problems involved in fitting the model that we'll talk about are underfitting and overfitting, uh, challenges in establishing internal validity, and uh, issues around leakage. And then when you go to apply models, some of the challenges that you'll commonly face are establishing that the model generalizes well and has generalizability in a new setting, um, figuring out how to link the model to an effective intervention, and then how to make sure that that intervention uh, is fair when it's applied to patients identified by the model. So if you are given this data set, um, again, with really just with one predictor on the x-axis, and the task is for you to learn the relationship between um, the predictor, which is the x-axis, and the outcome, which is the y-axis, you can see that a reasonably good fit might look something like this, which is represented by the red line. So it's not perfect along the edges, it flattens out, uh, but, but I would say that this is a reasonably good representation of that curve uh, seen by the data. And that k equals 13 is just a reminder to myself to share with you that this is actually a k nearest neighbors model on this data set where the k was set to 13. And so this is a good fit. In contrast to what was a good fit on that last picture, underfitting is when you do not model important aspects of the data. And so if the relationship is curved, it's heavily curved and you learn a line, or you learn kind of a curve with a lesser relationship than you would get um, you, you know, if you correctly model the data, that's referred to as underfitting. Um, and in this case, you can see that, you know, the slopes are a lot um, less steep in this underfit data set as compared to the correctly or uh, well-fit data set. And the reason this data is underfit is that I set the K for the K nearest neighbors at 42. And so with the K set to 42, it's looking at all 42 neighbors around it. And by not focusing on the local neighbors and by focusing on more and more distant neighbors, the predictions end up being kind of more closer to the average across this whole data set uh, than they are to what would be kind of a good representation of this data. In contrast to that, overfitting is when you model every nook and cranny and nuance of the data, even if that nook and cranny represents noise or erroneous input. And so this case was, is, you know, highlighted by setting the K to one, where each prediction is made by looking only at the single closest neighbor. And you can see that this learns a very jagged and kind of flexible relationship that kind of wavers back and forth. Um, and it's very, very unlikely that the predictions shown here represent the kind of true relationship in the world. Um, and by modeling all of that noise and trying to contort itself to kind of capture every noisy value on this uh, curve, that model is overfit, which means it's probably not gonna generalize well to a new data point outside of this model. So looking more closely at that overfit data set, um, there is a question that comes up when you are, you know, internally validating your data uh, or your model, which is, does your model fit well in your training data? And does it fit well in data that it hasn't seen? And so if you look at this 
data here. Let's say you're fitting a model using data from Michigan Medicine. An overfit model may perform very well on the data that was used to train it. Notice how the model here gets the training data exactly correct. The training points are represented by the um, X's, whereas the test points are represented by O's. And you can see how almost every single one of the X's has uh, a red bar through it. And the only places where that's not true is probably where there are you know, two uh, values along that uh, X axis that have two different Y values. But notice how for that test data, which was data that was set aside, which the K nearest neighbors model did not have access to, you can see how the test data um, almost a lot of, there's a lot of test data that doesn't have a red line running through it. And so the model performs a lot worse on the test data as compared to how well it performs on the training data. So to establish that a model is internally valid, especially when that model has a capability to overfit, you have to set aside some data to evaluate for the presence of overfitting by comparing the training data to the test data or by making sure that there's some piece of data that the model hasn't seen that you're evaluating its performance on. And so in this case, um, I think something like a third or half the data was bucketed into this test data set, which was never seen by the nearest neighbor model. And so when we measure the performance of this K nearest neighbors model, we measure it in the test data, not in the training data. So there's a few different ways that you can establish internal validity. Um, the simplest way is holdout validation, which is what I showed you on the last slide. So in holdout validation, you train the model on two thirds of your data set and you evaluate or validate your model on the remaining one third of your data. So that's pretty straightforward. And one key thing to notice here or mention here is that that two third and one third are assigned randomly, typically. Um, you don't systematically assign those cases um, for the most part. Another way is to do cross validation. So an example of cross validation would be you divide your data into three groups. You repeat the process of holdout validation three times where each of those three groups takes a turn being the validation group um, from the holdout validation. So you train the model on two of the groups, test it on the third group, and then you rotate around until each group has had a chance to be the test uh, or validation group. And then another way of establishing internal validity is bootstrapping or subsampling. And in this case, what you do is you sample randomly from your data with or without replacement. If you sample without replacement, it's the same as holdout validation. If you sample with replacement, it's known as bootstrapping. And then you perform this process multiple times. Um, and you might perform it 50 times or 100 times and, you know, basically get an average of the uh, model fit on this data set that it has not seen for different parts of your data. So notice that in holdout validation, you're actually training a single model, whereas in cross validation and in bootstrapping, you're actually training multiple models on different sections of your data and then validating your model on the remainder sections of the data. So if you're a visual person, uh, and you imagine that you know, this is your data laid out horizontally where that white section represents the training data and the blue section represents test data, then this is basically holdout validation where two thirds or you know, three quarters of your data is used for training, the white portion, 
and the remainder, the blue portion is used for uh, evaluating your model or validating it. If you divide your data into three groups and repeat the process of holdout validation three times, then that's considered cross-validation. And then if you kind of sample your data in different ways, um, similar to what you did in holdout validation, but you repeat, repeat that process multiple times, that's known as either bootstrapping or subsampling, depending on how you selected the rows from your data set. And so the main reason we do these is because the, a lot of the models we're looking at have the capability to overfit. And so we basically cannot train the model on the entire data set and then evaluate the performance of the model on the entire data set and expect that to be an accurate measure of how well that model is doing. The last concept I wanted to talk about was leakage, but I'll kind of couch that in a larger discussion about the two common types of problems you face when you're um, modeling uh, as it relates to model performance. The first problem is when you fit your model and you look to, you know, you look at the area under the curve, you look at the accuracy, you look at, you know, different measures of model performance and the model just is terrible. When you have really bad performance, this is a very tough problem to solve and it may not be solvable. You have to ask yourself, do you have access to all the right predictors? Um, is there something that would be really important to know about to be able to predict the outcome that you don't have access to? You want to know about is the data recorded correctly? Are there data entry errors that um, may lead to your model not being able to correctly predict the outcome? You then start to wonder about are there measurement errors in your data? So both on the predictor side and on the outcome side, are you measuring things correctly? You can imagine how if your outcome is not measured correctly, you're not going to be able to predict the outcome because the outcome actually isn't a true representation of reality. And the other thing, if you've kind of accounted for all those things, is really thinking hard about, is it even plausible for an expert to be able to predict the outcome if they were shown all the predictors that you have access to. Because there's a lot of phenomenon in medicine and in health more broadly where the you know important outcomes are just simply not predictable, even if you have access to all the kind of relevant predictors. Um, because things like health behavior are very, very difficult uh, to predict at an individual level accurately. The other type of problem you can have is really, really good performance. And you might look at that at first and say, that's not really a problem. But usually when you have really, really good performance, something problematic is going on and you need to figure out what that is. This is an easier problem to solve because uh, there are relatively few causes of this as compared to all the different things that can cause poor performance. The first thing you want to know are, is, uh, are any of your predictors actually measuring some aspect of the outcome? So as an example, imagine that you had two things uh, that represent the outcome and you correctly bucketed one of them as an outcome and you accidentally left the other one as a predictor. This commonly happens if you are trying to predict the results of some survey and you know one of the fields, which was an outcome field, got slipped in as a predictor. And so you were using essentially the outcome to predict the outcome. When your outcome leaks into your predictors, meaning there are aspects of your outcome that are accidentally introduced into the predictors without intent, that's called leakage. Um, and this is a, a fairly common problem that you run across 
um, especially when you're cleaning the data set yourself uh, or you're looking at lots of variables and not carefully vetting each variable for whether it should be included in the model or not. If the data set has a time or temporal component, another question you have to ask is, is your outcome happening at the same time or happening before the predictors? It turns out that in a lot of cases, if you know which patients are going to, you know, let's say, uh, be transferred to the ICU or which patients are going to die in the hospital, you can very accurately predict, you know, which patients were sick three days ago. Um, if you accidentally have information from the future included as a predictor. So this really is more specific to time series type data, but you have to make sure you're not accidentally predicting something that you already should have known about um, based on its temporal relationship between the predictors and the outcome. If all those things you know, are ruled out, then I think the other thing is to think about is the outcome just super obvious, um, at least to experts uh, when they're given the access to the predictors? If it is super obvious to experts, that doesn't mean that you don't need a model. That might mean that you can use the model in other ways uh, to be able to drive other care processes or workflows. But it is something that you want to know is there are some things that are really obvious. For example, uh, we have great algorithms that can uh, read your handwriting and see whether you, you wrote a one or a two or a three or four um, that are used to decide you know, how to route your mail. Even though it's trivial for a human to you know, read handwriting, uh, and many humans can read, uh, by having an algorithm be able to do that, you can have automated sorting of mail and save a ton of time for humans. So. Just because an outcome is obvious doesn't mean the model can't be useful, but you really have to figure out how you're going to operationalize that model for it to be useful. In terms of applying the model, the first major problem is the problem of generalizability or the lack of generalizability. So let's say you take a risk of cancer model developed in an oncology clinic where they see mostly patients with cancer, and you decide to use it in a primary care clinic where most patients don't have cancer, do you expect that model to work well? So it's possible, especially if not every patient who walks into oncology clinic has cancer, that the model might successfully assign patients with cancer a higher probability of having cancer than patients without cancer in a primary care population. But, a model that was trained in oncology clinic is going to predict that most patients have cancer simply because that is the data that it was trained on. So this is what's referred to as a calibration problem. When you take a model from one environment, apply it to another environment, if the baseline level of risk is very different in those two environments, your model's probabilities are going to be you know, uh, inaccurate, sometimes grossly inaccurate. So a calibration is problem is when the model incorrectly assigns probabilities, even if it's able to correctly sort patients from highest to lowest risk, the actual probabilities might still be wrong. Now, on the other hand, imagine this scenario. Hospital A has a protocol for when to order a chemistry panel which is a type of lab test. In hospital B, physicians just order this chemistry panel randomly, like whenever they want. There's no protocol for when to order this. So what if hospital A had developed a predictive model and then that model gets applied to hospital B? The model just simply won't be able to distinguish which patients are more likely to get a chemistry panel at hospital B because there is no rhyme or reason to why physicians order it. It's ordered randomly. So when you simply can't even make any you know, uh, predictions that are accurate across uh, you know, a, a range of patients, uh, 
this is referred to as a discrimination problem. And more specifically, a discrimination problem is a problem where if you're, you know, take two random patients from the data set, your model has no idea which patient is at higher risk of experiencing the outcome. In this case, uh, receiving a chemistry panel. And when your model can't do that, that's a even bigger problem known as a discrimination problem. It's usually possible to fix a calibration problem. It's usually not possible to fix a discrimination problem. The other major challenge that you face when you go to apply models in the real world is that in order for the model to make a difference in patient care, you have to implement or operationalize it in some way. So an example of this might be uh, you might run a model every 15 minutes uh, in the hospital to identify patients at high risk of sepsis. And if a patient crosses a specific threshold of risk, then you page uh, the patient's nurse. Another way you might operationalize a model is run a model when a nurse opens a patient's chart and flag that uh, chart by issuing some kind of an uh, interruptive alert to the, to the nurse to say that this patient is at high risk for something. And finally, another way that you could operationalize a model is you could rank patients from sickest to least sick, to least sick uh, in the emergency department and then have the emergency department doctors see the sickest patients first. So the point I wanna really get across here is not just the different ways that you can operationalize a model, but that even if a model performs well, its ability to impact people's lives in a positive way depends on the effectiveness, not just of the model, but also of the intervention that you attach to it. So if you have no intervention, there's no benefit. And on the flip side, if your intervention is weak, meaning it doesn't really solve the problem, even if you can find the right patients to help, if you actually can't help them, you're not going to make any you know, positive impact in patients' lives or in people's lives. The, this has other downstream effects which deal with fairness. So when you link a model to an intervention, you have to take into account fairness. Does your model perform equally well in pe people of different racial backgrounds? Does it perform equally well in women and men? Similarly, when you link the model to the intervention, who does the intervention help or hurt and who gets left out? This seems like a very kind of esoteric or very specific thing if it's the first time that you're coming across it. But there are several prominent examples um, out there where this has had major impacts. And one example I'll, I'll share from the news uh, from 2018 was this news story about how Amazon was using a machine learning algorithm to screen resumes to decide who to hire. And what was happening is that they were using their prior hiring practices to train this algorithm and their prior hiring practices were uh, in essence hiring mostly men. So what ended up happening was effectively Amazon's machine learning algorithm taught itself that male candidates were preferable and it actually penalized resumes that included the word women's such as when it's used in the phrase women's chess club captain which makes no sense at all and is counterproductive. So this is just one example. Um, there is a book called Weapons of Math Destruction that you should take a look at if this is an area of interest for you. But anytime you apply a model, it will have a, it can have a disparate impact on people of different racial groups uh, for various vulnerable populations. So you need to really think through who the model and intervention help and who they hurt um, as you go to make decisions about how best to implement these models.